So let me start out by saying that uh, if you have questions, please interrupt me. I'd much rather that we have a lively dialogue than that I uh, get through all of my slides and people don't appreciate what, uh, what I'm trying to say. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, a technique that you can use to detect bugs and more importantly to prevent bugs, which is namely pluggable type checking. It lets you write your own type checker uh, for the, whatever properties you care about and then uh, run that as part of your normal compilation process. This is actually closely related to the discussion that we were having on the, <coughs> the mailing list about dynamic languages and type languages. In some sense, this is viewing Java as an untyped language, as a dynamic language that you can, in a principled way, uh, add the sorts of types that you care about. So here's a motivation. This is a, a screenshot of a website. And the important thing about this is uh, that the body of it is Java Lang null pointer exception. This is not what you want your website to look like. Even though the code that created this passed the type checker, it was perfectly fine. So the problem is that Java's type checking is too weak. That is, it's incredibly useful, but it doesn't do enough. So it prevents a lot of bugs. For instance, it prevents you from uh, assigning a string into an integer variable. Uh, the compiler is going to prevent you from doing that. <coughs> the difficulty is that it doesn't prevent enough bugs. So here's an example. This is code that type checks, but if you run it, you're going to get a null pointer exception at runtime. Here's more code that type checks, and if you uh, run it, you're going to get an unsupported operation exception at runtime. Now, these are actually the good cases. The bad cases are cases where uh, the error doesn't show up, where you don't get an exception at runtime. For instance, suppose you create a date and put that into a map. Then you side effect the date and put that into the map too. Your map is now corrupted. And you're going to discover that at a much later time when you try to use it. As another example, <coughs> if you uh, execute a query, then this will throw an unsupported operation exception. Other type, other, uh, and depending on what the user input is, it can throw a SQL exception as well. These are, again, things that we'd like to prevent to use it at compile time. We'd like to prevent this kind of code from, uh, from type checking. And there are lots of other examples. You can have errors in your quality tests. You can uh, have accidental use of uninitialized data values. You can have uh, data in the wrong format. So how can we prevent these? The solution that I'm proposing is use of a pluggable type system. So the idea is, think about the properties that are important to you in your particular application and then design a type system to solve that particular problem. Now, you write type qualifiers in your code. You can also have it happen automatically by using type inference if you like, so that you don't actually have to write anything. For instance, we can say immutable date equals new date. And now, if you try to make this side effect, you'll get a compile time error. <clears throat> because you've said that that was immutable, but now you're trying to change it. Yeah, question. So how do you know which methods are going to have side effects? Okay. Uh, the way that you know that is that you have an annotated copy of the JDK. If you use our tool, you get an annotated copy of the JDK that tells you what all the methods that have side effects are. More specifically, it tells you for each method, does it change the receiver, does it change the first argument, does it change the second argument, etc. And, uh, and so now your checking is modular, just like the compiler is. So in other words, all you need to see is all of your code and the interfaces of the things that you're going to use. There was another question here. I was going to say, so basically you can't use a third party that has it, uh, any, you can't be using any third party libraries that haven't been annotated, right? So that's a great question. Uh, if you use third party code that has not been annotated, then you have several possibilities. One possibility is you go in and annotate it all. Just the signatures, you don't have to do the body. The second possibility is use a type inference tool that will automatically add the annotations. And we have a couple of type inference tools uh, for some of the checkers that I'm going to show you. Even without access to the source? Yeah. That's more okay. You need access to the bytecode, though. Mm -hmm. But you probably have that. Um, and the third possibility is that you supply a compiler uh, command line option that says, please ignore errors that are related to this particular library. 
Now, that's going to uh, mean that you're going to find a set of problems in your code, but you no longer have a complete end-to-end -end guarantee, which you would expect. Yeah? I suppose you could also use some AOP tool, right? Like, you know, so I say, like, oh, all methods starting with set, they should get the uh, changes receiver, whatever. Okay, yeah, um, so you probably, I mean, AOP typically is a way of modifying behavior. Here, if you knew that fact, then you could just go and add all those annotations to the external library. You don't have to actually edit the external library. You can have a separate file that says what the annotations are in the external library, and then the tool will read it. Great. Good questions. You're, uh, you're all thinking straight about this. Okay, so now, once you've decided what your type system is, that is what its rule should be, and you've written the type qualifiers in your code, then you just run the type checker like uh, as usual. So for instance, here's a possible command line you might type, java c minus processor nullness checker, modfile.java, and minus processor is already built into Java. So this isn't a, a change in that sense. Um, and that will output an error that looks just like any other compile time error. In this case, it says, um, you're using variable db2, but I don't have a guarantee that's uh, not null. So you might or might not get a runtime exception. OK, so that's the motivation. Now I'm going to tell you about how you can write these annotations in your code. I'll then discuss some pluggable type checkers, and I can give you demos as well. Um, then I'll tell you how you could write your own checker for some property that you care about. We distribute a number of these, but you probably have other ideas about what's important to you. And finally, I'll give a few conclusions. <coughs> so Java 7, uh, Java 5 already introduced annotations, but only annotations on declarations. Java 7 permits you to annotate any use of a type, not just declarations. So you can say, for instance, that uh, this string is untainted, the, the query that you're going to be executing. You can also say, this is a list of non-null strings. And this is the sort of thing you could have written in Java 5. The rest of them are not. You can say, this is a list of non-null strings. Or for instance, suppose you uh, spent some time building up a graph, and now you know you're not going to change it anymore. You could then cast it to be immutable, and then uh, guarantee that you don't make any modifications afterward. You can probably look for those. And here's an existing Java uh, class. And I've given you a better and more informative type for it. <coughs> Unmodifiable list really implements read-only list of read-only t. In Java, uh, the current Java says it implements list of t. Yeah? You said the compiler will check it. <clears throat> uh, how about you know dynamic languages and uh, reflection? OK. So for one of our type systems, the one for reference immutability, it actually has some support for reflection. For all of the others, uh, if you have things like casts, they'll warn you that you're doing a cast. But uh, in general, they don't check reflection. In, in other words, you know, reflection lets you do anything. Reflection lets you uh, change the contents of a string, which is supposed to be immutable in Java. It lets you call any private method, etc. cetera. There's, uh, there's no way for a type system in general to figure out exactly what you're doing with reflection, whether it's evil or not. Statically, but my question. Oh, I guess, dynamically, I see. Dynamically, it, it doesn't have any bearings on a, a, okay. a, on a runtime. So, if, if you're thinking about dynamically, these uh, our checkers are intended to be run as compile time checks. You can imagine adding in, uh, for instance, you could find all the places that it wasn't able to give you a guarantee. You could imagine turning all those into runtime checks. Our current tools don't do that, but it would be possible to do. Yeah, good question. So what's an untainted string? Oh, so um, typically people uh, use the term tainting to indicate uh, any data that's coming from the user or from an untrusted source is called tainted. And if it's guaranteed not, for instance, the user could type uh, a JavaScript script uh, as their string. And you don't want to just shove that into your HTML. Or they could type uh, some kind of SQL injection attack into their string. You don't want to just uh, concatenate that onto a SQL query. So this is like trusted, right? Yeah, sure. Untainted is the same as trusted. 
Yeah. I'll actually show you an example of a checker that works with that a little bit later. And typically, anything that comes in from the user is untrusted or tainted, and then you might have some validation routine that uh, turns it into a trusted or untainted one. Good question. Thanks for catching me on the jargon. Oh, OK, so this is a Java 7 annotation syntax. But one cool thing about our tools is that they're backward compatible. You're allowed to write these annotations in the new locations in comments. And if you do, <coughs> then our compiler will process them. And any normal compiler, you know, say the Java 5 compiler or, or the Java 4 compiler that you're forced to use at work, will just ignore them. So you can get the benefits uh, even if your coworkers or your boss don't want to use this. Okay, so why would you want to use these? There are a few uh, advantages it gives. A big one is just better documentation. When you write code, you know whether you intend the fields to be null or not, or the return values to be null or not. Now you have an opportunity to write that down in a disciplined way. And furthermore, it's not just that it's documented, it's that it's automatically checked. So you're guaranteed the documentation stays up to date and it's still useful. Um, it helps you find bugs in programs, find places where you've used, uh, where your idea of what the specification should be is different than what the code actually does. Now, one thing that uh, distinguishes this from a lot of other tools for finding bugs is that it aims to be complete. That is, it can give you a guarantee that all the code that you checked has no errors of a given type. It's not just trying to do some uh, quick and dirty uh, catch a few of the errors thing, but actually trying to show that, all of, that there are none there. And this is modulo, several things that people have already brought up. It's modulo use of reflection, and it's modulo code that you're not checking. For instance, because it's in an external library that you've said you're not going to check. It's also modulo native code and a few other things, you know, also in those same categories. Um, this can help you to do better uh, optimization. It can also help you to do better analysis of other types. And another cool thing is that if you're doing a certain amount of checking statically in the compiler, then you can write fewer assertions. You can do fewer runtime checks. Okay, so let me. Uh, so that's how you write these things, uh, either now or in the future. And now let me tell you a little bit about uh, the pluggable type checkers. So here are some of the sample checkers that are distributed with our set of tools. We have uh, a checker that tells you if you have any possible nullity references in your program. We have another one that tests interning, uh, which tells you if you have any equality tests that are wrong. So interning may be familiar to you from the string.intern method that says if you have two strings that have the same uh, abstract value, that is the same sequence of characters, you can make them actually point to exactly the same object. And that saves you space and saves you time. And it also lets you document that these things are really guaranteed to be identical. We have uh, checkers for uh, checking whether you are accidentally doing side effects that you shouldn't whether there's unexpected mutation. And we have a bunch of other simple checkers that you can create in your own. So you can say whether a particular string is encrypted or not. If it's not encrypted, maybe that's not something you want to be passing over the wire. Yeah. Can you make something immutable just for a period of time and then change it to not immutable? Like, basically, throughout these, this certain section of code, you want to guarantee that it doesn't change, but then you want to make it, it, it it's okay if it changes afterwards. <laughs> So here's an example of when you might want to do that. Um, suppose that you have a data structure that you're building up and that you own, mm -hmm. but you're about to call a method, and you don't want that method making any changes to it. So if, you, if that method has its parameter declared as read-only, then uh, it is not allowed to make any changes. But of course, that doesn't affect your ability to change it. So we actually have uh, two separate notions, one called read-only, that lets this type of aliasing happen, and another one called immutable that does not let this type of aliasing happen. Okay. Um, now, you can't typically change something from uh, from immutable to one of the others without doing an unsafe cast, because it, immutable is trying to give you guarantees yeah. about aliasing. Yeah. But you can do these others. If you had an example where you took a mutable variable and assigned it to a new variable and declared the new variable as immutable, mm -hmm. 
but that, then that you, your checker could then check that the new variable didn't get modified. But exactly. then what if the old variable does? You can still modify it through the old variable, which points to the same thing. Right. So in that case, the checker would give you a warning at the assignment saying that that's not, uh, it would either say you can't do that, or it would, if you would put in a cast in explicitly, it would say this is an unchecked cast. So that's, I mean, uh, so every type system has certain limitations. Every, there, every, for every type system, there's code that behaves perfectly fine, but that the type system can't prove is fine. And that's a reason that uh, even in Java 5, you still need casts sometimes. And these checkers let you put those casts in. What that means is, essentially, it says, every place there's a cast, it's your responsibility to think hard. And everywhere else, you don't have to worry about it. And that's also related to this notion, you know, that, that's where the type system, you can have dynamism in the type system, even though it's a statically typed language. Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, encrypted strings. Uh, we already discussed tainted or trusted. Uh, you can implement access control this way. You can also think about the encoding. For instance, this string is a SQL expression, or it's a URL, or is this string in ASCII or is it in Unicode, so that you don't get those messed up? Now, there are a bunch of people who are building checkers using our framework, using the syntax and the framework that, uh, that we've built, and, and these are some of them. <coughs> yeah? So could you elaborate a bit on the access control? What do you mean by... Uh... Oh, so, so for instance, you might say this is a, uh, a port that's allowed to receive data or this is a port that's closed, as one example. So I'm not talking about Java access control like private, public, protected. Yeah? How, how do you statically enforce the code? Uh, you mean uh, these? Yeah. OK. This is the way you do it. And we'll be seeing examples, I think, not of encoding. But what you would say is, here's a method, and its argument has to be uh, say ASCII and then uh, once you've written that annotation you have to do that by hand or maybe you have an inference tool that does it but um, then now whenever you're checking any of the callers of it if they have something that is not ASCII and they try to make the call then they'll get a compile time error now uh, suppose you get something from the user and you don't know whether that thing is ASCII or not or it comes across the wire <coughs> So that's a place where you would actually have to have uh, a method that checks it, and that would be a place that's unchecked. So typically, there's going to be some clever uh, function that's going to actually be checking this, and you're going to have to trust that. That's a place where there will be a cast in your program, but that's only going to be at a very few places, hopefully exactly one, at the boundary of your system. And as I said, anywhere that there's a cast, that's an indication that you need to think hard about it and make sure that it's actually right. Because we're not going to write a type checker that looks can look at a method and say, aha, this is clearly a method that's validating that, that this is a, a, a legal SQL command, for example. That seemed hard. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not that smart. <laughs> yeah. So what's the advantage of using a, a URL annotation over just a URL class? Um, not passing around strings. So you, uh, you probably should do that but that doesn't mean that all your code does. Okay? Great. So, how do you use a checker? As I said, it's just a compiler plugin. Uh, there's already a system called annotation processors for doing these plugins. Um, and they uh, use exactly the same mechanism that your Java compiler does to issue errors. So after you've uh, given this, then you get error messages this form, which is identical to what ordinary ones do, because it's using exactly the same interface. OK, so let me, uh, enough of talking about this. Let's actually see whether this thing works. OK, so um, first I'm going to give you a, OK, so here is, uh, some code. This is actually code from one of our ch our checkers. So we've run all our checkers on themselves. Um, 
This is something that is going to check uses of uh, the new construct in Java. And it uh, gets the, uh, the path, it gets the method name, and then it asks, how is this method annotated? Essentially, it's asking, what are the annotations on this method? So let's um, run the type checker on this and see, if, if, see what happens. So there's an error. And it says the error is right here. It says there are incompatible types for method. The argument is nullable, but it's supposed to be non-null. In other words, if we were to look at annotations from element, and we can actually look at that if you want, then the, uh, the annotation on that says method has to be non-null. But here, it turns out that enclosing symbol <coughs> possibly returns null. So, in other words, this is a place where this method can go wrong because visit new array is calling it wrong. Yeah. So, see, so you have both the nullable and the non-null annotation. So, what's the default if there's no annotation? Ah, okay. So, good. You'll. Uh, I've written a bunch of. Uh, I've written nullable here be, uh, to make it clear, and also because you need to. The default is this. For, any, for everything except local variables, the default is non-null. For local variables, the default is nullable. And uh, the reason for that is it turns out it dramatically reduces the number of annotations you need to write. Oftentimes in public interfaces, then you really intend things not to be null. But we have a, a flow-sensitive type refinement mechanism that if you have uh, nullable annotations within a method, can often ignore them when it sees that you're actually assigning something that is non-null. So, if you didn't understand that jargon, then don't worry about it. Essentially, it's non-null except for locals, and the reason is that that reduces the number of annotations you have to write dramatically. Yeah. So you can have multiple annotations, right? Oh, right, so I mean, Something you mean can be nullable, have... I mean, one, one object can be several. Okay. So, you can't say this is a nullable non-null, but you could no, say no, it's no. I mean, not if they're, null if they're and interned and read-only. Exactly. Uh, you know, not yeah. that I recommend you put a whole string. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, so there's actually a serious question, right? I mean, there Which could is, be reasons. Does this clutter your code and make it totally unreadable? And I'm going to give you some statistics later on that suggest that that's actually not the case. So yeah. the second argument, the past annotations of others, that node is the compiler smart smart enough to realize that that, you know, is declared as nullable, it's really non-nullable because you had the assertion, or is it not um, able to... Oh, this one? Yeah. Yep. It figured out that it's not nullable. Figured it out. Tested. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up because I had forgotten. Uh, so, here we said that uh, node is nullable, but then we wrote an assertion, and so now, even if this needed to be non-null, it would be fine. because. The, the compiler looks at if statements, it looks at assert statements, it looks at all other types of control flow, it looks at operations that themselves would only have succeeded if the thing was non-null, uh, and after that, it assumes that it's non-null. That's this thing uh, that I was calling um, local uh, type refinement. So even if, if something has one type, then after an if or after an assert, it has the other type. until some, it, until the compiler sees some expression that might change that. Great. Yes? You had mentioned earlier that the compilation is modular so that you have an external description of a function like annotations from element if that's yeah. in the library. Is that description complex enough that if that function has a conditional in it such that if you pass in a null, it might return a null, but if you're guaranteed to pass in a non-null, it's guaranteed to give you a non-null? Yes, they can do that. So the question was, um, well, what you just asked was, uh, can annotate, can these annotations be polymorphic over qualifiers? Yes. Uh, essentially, you said, can, can we show that if you pass in a non-null, you get out a non-null, if you pass in a nullable, you get out a nullable? And the answer is yes. So here's the actual uh, declaration of that. And since we haven't written anything here, this has to be non-null, and that has to be non-null. So, so you're saying when, in Java 7, <coughs> you can be polymorphic on the, um, on the annotations below. Correct. And uh, let me clarify for a second. That is not part of Java 7. There are two separate things that I'm telling you about here. 
One is the mere ability to write annotations in new locations. That's part of Java 7. That's an official part of the language. The second is, what does a particular annotation mean? What does non-null mean? Or what does polymorphic over null mean? Or what does immutable mean? And that's defined by the checker that you choose to, to write. And that is not going to be uh, standardized, set in stone at this time. You can use the ones you want. It's possible that this will be shipped by Sun <coughs> as part of the JDK, but it will not be a specified as part of Java. It will just be a useful external tool. Right, but so if you have an annotation called X and an annotation called Y, and, if, and <coughs> if you have two T's, what if, what if, what if the only differ because one has a, has a parameter with the annotation X and the other one has a parameter Y, it will be distinguished? No. It will not be distinguishable. Well, so. Uh, any any overloading like that is actually handled. Uh, so uh, let me restate the question so that everyone understands. In um, in Java, you can overload methods. So you can say you have foo of object and foo of integer. The question is, can you say foo of uh, at x integer and foo of at y integer? And uh, if you were running a compiler that didn't understand, I mean, if you had chosen to uh, compile this, even with the Java 7 compiler, but you chose not to supply the processor argument, then it wouldn't know the difference between those. So for backward compatibility, though, that can't be legal. And, and it isn't. And that's why you need the polymorphism. That's why you need special annotations to indicate that there's polymorphism, because you can't write both of those. Good question. But essentially, that's a backward compatibility issue. Yeah. I, I suppose these are just compile time annotations and not preserved at runtime. Uh, that's correct. So they will be uh, carried through to the class file and all that, but uh, especially the ones inside the body, <coughs> you can't access it compile time because reflection doesn't generally have access to the body of a method. Oh, I see. Uh, I mean, you can always use reflection to look up the annotations on, uh, on a signature. Okay, great questions. Um, okay, so let's go back to where we were. Um, so here is that line that was no good. And it turns out that, uh, I mean, so this can return null, so you've got to fix it. One way to fix it would be to change the definition of annotations from element, and the other is to change the call to annotations from element. And in this particular, so oh, by the way, all these bugs are real bugs that we committed. Uh, and we didn't have our tools running yet because we were building the tools. Uh, so I'll show you the actual fix that we made, which is, oops, to add this. So this is saying, if it's null, then you return, you say, there aren't any annotations there. And now when we run this, compilation is successful. So that's cool. There are two things that are cool about that. One thing that's cool about that is we don't have this potential problem, which we found out about because uh, our, our checker that was trying to find null pointer exceptions threw a null pointer exception. <laughs> the cooler thing about this, though, is there are no more possible null pointer exceptions in this code. OK, let's look at um, another example. So here is uh, a JUnit test. And it is just checking the behavior of JUnit uh, 4.3 on null references. So we're asking if you say assert equals on null and the string null, should that test succeed or should that test fail? It should fail. Yeah, it should fail. In fact, uh, here's a hint. It says, should fail. It should throw an assertion error because this assert uh, isn't uh, isn't going to be true. That's what it should do. What does it actually do? Let's see. I'm actually just going to run this. Wow, this is really horrible. But <laughs> here's what happened. J unit threw a null pointer exception. Okay, it shouldn't do that. <laughs> so let's see if we can figure out 
what happened. Here's the code for JUnit, and let's run the nullness checker on it. <coughs> so it's telling us about some problems. So here's an example. It says expected might be null, and uh, we're calling it here. So in this case, uh, so I mean we're dereferencing it right here. In this case, this is a private method. If you go look at all the places that this is called, it's actually never called with a uh, with a non-null value. So the right way to fix this is just by saying. Oops. Now, in some sense, I haven't really fixed anything about the code, but I have documented it. Let's see the other errors. Okay, here is an example where we say if o1.getClass is array, so in other words, if o1 is an array and o2 is an array, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out that o1 and o2 could be null. That's perfectly legal. So the code that should really have been there was this. So let's... Um, And let's look at the last problem, which is very similar. You're formatting an object, and you're saying, um, we want to print out the name of that object. I mean, sorry, the name of the class of that object. But that object could be null. So the, thing, the right thing to do here is to, uh, if it's null, print the value null and otherwise continue. So that is the last error. I already fixed that one. So let's, um, whoops. So let's rerun the checker. And those were all the errors in that. These were actually, those are in JUnit 4.3. They've since been fixed in exactly this way. Okay, so that was nullness. Questions about the nullness checker? Yeah. So would your J unit, the actual test you wrote now fail? Because it's... Oh, it's great. I forgot to do that part of the demo, didn't I? So it succeeded because I said I expect this test to right. fail. So JUnit does the right thing. So this, this says we expect the test to throw an insertion error. If the test had not thrown an insertion error, JUnit would have said test failed. In this case, it says test succeeded because the test did what I said the test was supposed to do. That's the way you write a test that's expected to fail in JUnit. But so why didn't it fail to compile, though? Wasn't it, what, what, didn't you just change the third equals to change the equality? That, 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 that was the second part. part. There's two oh, parts. Part? Part. Uh, right, the private one I changed. The oh, public okay. one, public one I left. Right, In, right. You, yeah, okay. okay, great, sorry, thanks. So there's two things, there's test equality and test arrays, right? Because you changed two things in there. I changed three, yeah, oh, okay, okay. I changed the private one, and then I changed two public ones. Okay. For uh, these two problems. One for uh, test equality and one for test arrays. Okay. Great. So, uh, good. That's nullness. Let me show you uh, a demo of the, uh, of the mutation tests. So again, I'm going to show you. Uh, actually, that's fine. I'm going to show you code from. Oh, yes. I was just wondering, do, does, uh, do you have plugins for Eclipse or IntelliJ that will show you these annotations on the, uh, the, the quick docs stuff? So uh, I'm not using Eclipse because I have a marvelous power to make Eclipse crash during demos. <laughs> uh, we have an Eclipse plugin. It is not perfect. There are people working on improving it. Uh, I know people who use it. It has some problems. Can the the, um, but 
And if you're using Eclipse, then I would strongly urge you to use the annotations and comments feature because Eclipse, of course, it hasn't been updated for Java 7. So it would uh, tell you syntax errors all over the place. Um, IntelliJ, uh, in their, uh, I think, either June or July, I can look up the exact date, then it will actually understand the syntax. Uh, I can look up the exact date for you. Okay, so this again is part of our, uh, our framework for doing these checkers. This is something called annotation location. So it tells you things like, uh, suppose you have a uh, list of arrays and that thing has two generic parameters and there's an annotation deep down in the middle of it. How do you convert, how, how do you say exactly where in that big complicated type the annotation actually sits? And the way that it does that is it has a list of integers and essentially the integers tell you, uh, you know, if you take the, the third parameter and then you take the first list level, etc. Um, now you notice that this class is immutable but we don't, do not want annotation locations jumping all over the program. That would be not good. Um, and then, just for emphasis, I've written immutable here, though you wouldn't have to, given that it's up there. So this is the internal representation. So let's see what happens if we run the checker uh, on this. So, bummer, there's an error. So it's complaining about this line. Remember, I showed you the location field, and the location field was supposed to be immutable. Now, here, I'm creating collections of unmodifiable list of location. So, what could possibly go wrong here? I said the thing was supposed to be immutable, and I'm calling collections of unmodifiable list. So, it looks like there's a little bit of a difference with the way that you're using immutable than, um, like, I thought of, like, with final, right? Where um, objects that are parts of that object mm -hmm. can be changed generally, right? But with immutable, they can, it seems like, right? That's correct. Okay. Th thanks for bringing that up. So um, the immutability that we're talking about here is not the shallow immutability of the top level it's of your data the structure. Through. It's the abstract right value. So uh, you can explicitly exclude state uh, fields from the abstract state. So ordinarily, uh, immutability applies to the entire abstract state. And you can say, for instance, this uh, field is a cache, or this field is transient or something, and then uh -huh. you can uh, say, please don't count that field. Mm -hmm. But by default, all fields are included. Mm -hmm. And so with that, when you had said we didn't need to specify on, for this property on there that it was immutable because a class is immutable, it's because it's all inherited all the way down. Bingo. So you can say, you can put an annotation in there, mutable or something, yes. for a specific one? Okay. In fact, that's exactly how okay. it's spelled. Okay, okay. Yep. Good question. Is that why that issue is happening, that line? Or no. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good guess, though. So what's happening here, um, so the, what we want is that this dot location can't change out from under us. We call collections dot unmodifiable list, but uh, what, could, what could go wrong here? Unmodifiable what, list. Collections that unmodifiable list is just a proxying wrapper. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually protect you from the underlying list being mutated. Right. That's exactly right. Did people hear that? Mm -hmm. yep. So the difficulty is that someone else could have a pointer to this thing, and they could change that. You won't be able to make modifications through this, but someone else could. So this is related to the difference. I was telling you about the difference between reference immutability and object immutability. This is trying to guarantee object immutability. You don't want the, the abstract value to change out from under you. And that's why this uh, is this here is the right fix, which is make, brand, make a copy. And we'll throw the immutable annotation on that, saying that uh, you know, it's a brand new copy, so it's safe to do that because there are no aliases to it. And uh, this is sort of like just putting a cast here, but uh, it doesn't raise any warnings about, hey, you're casting. So that add immutable is actually required there? Um, yes, because if you just create a new array list, by default, that's mutable. I mean, 
backward compatibility in Java, if you create a new list, that's a mutable list. If you want something different, we have to say it. Right, but I thought that the location variable itself was flagged as immutable. Correct, it is. And, and so the initial set in the constructor doesn't count as part of the immutability. Uh, no, no. Okay, so uh, let me make an important distinction between assignment and mutation. This field is immutable. You can set this dot location equals whatever a hundred times in your program, as long as you always set it to an immutable value. You can assign it. Assignment is controlled via final and a new, uh, a new annotation we've added. Mutation is controlled by immutable and mutable, which are two annotations we've added. So Java in the past only had control over assignment and only in one direction was all it needed. Now, with our pluggable checker, it has control over assignment in both directions and over mutation in both directions. That's a great question. So yeah. you, had, you had said something about doing a deep immutability. If those had been um, a list of objects, would this then fail? If... I mean, in, integers are immutable, so therefore there's an implicit oh, uh, copy. You, know, you don't need to oh, worry about copying the members. Okay, um, so good question. It would not fail, and the reason is that it's deep, except for generics where you're explicitly specifying the type. If you're explicitly specifying the type, you get to say whatever you want here. And if you have a list, you can say list of non-null, you can say list of nullable, you can say list of immutable, uh, immutable dates, you can say list of mutable dates. So if the type is explicitly noted here, then you note it explicitly. If it's just a field, then it's inherited. So the same thing goes for arrays. You can mark each level of an array independently, but all the fields inherit from the object. So you can and say it turns out that uh, that's what you want in terms of flexibility and in terms of minimizing annotations in the usual case. So you can say an immutable list of mutable dates. Absolutely. And what that means is that you can't change the list. The list always contains the exact same objects but of course, those objects can get updated. They can't get pulled out and a new one put in. Yeah. So I take it that it picked up on the fact that integer is immutable inherently. If you had gone crazy and created a new array list and then instead of marking it, annotating it as immutable, put it inside an unmodifiable list, <laughs> given its knowledge of the libraries, would that affect? Um, so if you had done that, uh, in our current implementation, it would not have passed because of a limitation in uh, the way that polymorphic qualifiers are parsed. But we're working on fixing that. In, in particular, uh, some of our checkers handle that, and this checker doesn't happen to handle that at the moment. So, so uh, yes, it can be done. We have done it. It doesn't have to be done on this one. And it's uh, on our to-do list. Good question. I mean, and in fact, that may be what you want to do. Because the cool thing about this was it gave you dynamic checking. The cool thing about this is it gives you static checking. Now, if you're compiling your entire program with the, with the pluggable type checker, this is perfectly fine. But if it might link against uh, third-party code that hasn't necessarily been run through the type checker, you might want both. Okay, so uh, if we check this now, then it passes. So that was uh, a correctness issue. And we actually had annotations that were jumping all over the program it was, uh, as, as compilation went forward because of, of a uh, someone was keeping hold of one of these and modifying it afterward. Let me, so that was about correctness. Now let me show you optimization. So here is a, uh, a class, let me page up so you can see the name of the class is annotated type factory. Essentially, this is the thing that given an AST node, tells you what is the type on that AST node. <clears throat> and here is an optimization. 
it says, this is a map that given an AST node, like new or, uh, or a method call or something, remembers what the type is so that you don't have to recompute it all the time. Now, if you have an, uh, a map, then <coughs> the values in that should be immutable. Because if they're not, then things can go wrong. So let's see what happens if we test whether this optimization is properly implemented. It's not. <coughs> so here is the, uh, the getter. And it looks a lot like the standard getters. Uh, it says, if the cache contains it, then just return that. Otherwise, compute it, put it in the cache, and then return it. I'm sorry if that went too fast. I didn't quite understand what's the issue with having the value change. I mean, I understand the key can change, mm -hmm. but why can't the value not change? Oh, uh, right, that will not corrupt the map. So if the key changes, it corrupts the map. If the value changes, then uh, the abstraction is just broken. Oh, because if you put something in it, you expect to get the same thing back out. Thanks for asking that. So essentially this says, if we want to get the type on an AST node, then we say, is that in the cache? And if it is, just return it from the cache. Otherwise, you compute it. Uh, that's these two lines. Then you put it into the cache, and then finally you return it. So the error down here says, this does not work. Get uh, is returning, it, you've, it's found an immutable annotation type here but it expected immutable annotation type here. I'm sorry, annotated type here. In other words, get annotated type says it's going to return something that clients are allowed to mutate. The default is mutable. That's backward compatible with Java. The difficulty here is you're returning a pointer to a value that's in the cache. And once it's returned from here, people can side effect it all they want. And now you can try to pull it, the thing out of the cache and you get a different value than the one you put in. That is, it would be the same object, but it would be a different value, which is not what you want. So the solution to this is that when you return an element, you should copy it. And when you put it into the cache, you should also copy it. Oops. So you need to do this, you need to do both of these because you're returning a reference to that. And now people can side effect the reference. I mean, we can't control what other people are going to do with the thing we're returning. Now we know that they're going to, uh, to be modifying something that doesn't hurt us. Now, the alternative is, we could have said that this is immutable. That would have forced us to change client code. It's acceptable. In this case, we didn't want to change the interface. Yeah? You could see me if you could check at runtime whether an object we get is all the immutable. OK. So uh, the, this notion of immutability does not have any runtime representation. So there are certain things like string that are immutable. But we're letting you put immutable on any class at all, even the mutable ones. And we're not adding any runtime cost at all. You run this on a standard JVM with no extra fields, no extra bits. So in general, there's not a way of testing that. You could imagine having a class loader or some other mechanism that would add in that kind of uh, representation. Our current tools don't do that. Because we, we don't want to pay that cost. Yeah. I mean, here you're just on the actually check. Does did this object have the uh, this annotation attached to it? Objects don't have annotations attached to them. Types in your program oh, have yeah. annotations attached to them. Uh -huh. Runtime classes of objects don't have annotations attached to them. So, for instance, the uh, if I have a date in my hand, its class is date. Its type in the program might be mutable date, might be immutable date. I don't know. That was a long time ago. That was compile time. I don't have any runtime representation of that at all. At certain annotation types, you can't preserve the uh, annotation on, I mean, make the annotation that's on the class available 
but that's at not on a class, it's on an instance. But exactly, yes, I don't know, like if, if in Java 7 there is some fancy new mechanism to, to get instance level annotations. No, that would require uh, extra information to be carried along at runtime, and we decided that was not worth that was not worth it. Yeah, but there, sorry, it's, it's definitely, sorry. there are situations where it's a great thing to do. Uh, but those are situations where you should use some bytecode rewriting or something. Yeah, but so even in Java 7, it wouldn't even be possible. Um, it's not built in, no. You would need to uh, rewrite the bytecode or something like that. And there are situations where you'd want to do that, but it's not the default. Yeah? So could you declare element as immutable instead of the deep copies? Ah, so declare this element is immutable? Right. Um, well, the issue is we're worried about the annotated type. This is the key that's being used in the map, but we're worried about the values. In this particular case, I mean, you really don't want either one to be changed. And all I'm doing at this point is uh, is making sure that the values don't, don't change, not that the keys don't change. Okay, so Prevent the keys from changing, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Could, you could annotate the return values immutable. Yes. And then you wouldn't have to make those changes. Okay. Correct. Right. So you have two options. One is to put these two deep copies that I just showed you. The other is to uh, put immutable here, which may force you to change clients. Right. You had a question? I was going to ask something right along that line. Because that was the first thought that sprang to my head was declaring the return type as at immutable. And uh, the reason is that there was a bunch of client code that found it convenient to make changes. So uh, which design is better? I don't know, but you can express the one you're talking about. And now we know, right? You can just look at this code and see that this thing is in fact mutable. Yeah. But if clients expected to change elements in a the cache, they're probably supposed to share those changes, and now they are invisible. Uh, OK. So uh, in this particular design, they are not supposed to do any such thing. You could imagine a design where that was the case, and in that case, you wouldn't want to do these copies. I mean, what you're doing is you have the ability to express what your design is and have uh, the correctness of the code with respect to that design checked at compile time. So the design you're proposing is a reasonable design. It's not the design of this code. And if you did that, this code would be wrong. Although that's not really captured. I mean, those, those two alternatives look the same but in terms of the type annotations. Um, well, if you uh, go back up to the top uh, here in, we wouldn't have written immutable right here. That's a way that in which it would be different. In fact, you might put in fact, you might put mutable there if you wanted to make sure that people realize that could be changed. Right, putting mutable there would be redundant, but you are permitted to do it for emphasis. As a documentation. Exactly. But I think you said that clients found it useful to mutate those values. Or, or they found it useful to mutate them, but that does not mean that. So well, they found it useful to take a copy and mutate it. Right. Okay. So for instance, they said, "What's the type of this thing?" and then they did some kind of analysis on it and they were storing the results of their analysis. Or they were saying, okay, that one was a, uh, a non-null integer, now I want to create an array of non-null integers. Did you have a question that was queued up a little while ago? Um, well, yeah, which is not so, so if I understood correctly, putting like immutable on the element that's passed in wouldn't really protect the key, because someone could have a mutable reference and cast it to immutable and pass it in, right? Um, so, if you're doing casts, then you can't control anything. But if you, it was marked as immutable, then that would mean that no one in the world, and in the absence of casts and unchecked code and native code and reflection, <laughs> uh, if you have something that says immutable, no one in the world can modify it. No one in the world has an alias to it that is permitted to be changed. Okay, great. So, so understand that you you shouldn't cast uh, immutable to mutable. That would trigger some warning. But casting a mutable to a immutable because you want to pass it into some function that's not supposed to change anything, but you still have a mutable reference. So that's it's, also bad because that's also remember, bad. Yeah. immutable says no one in the world can change this. Now there's something called read only that says I can't change it, but someone else can. 
So you can go from immutable to read on only, or from mutable to read only, and that doesn't even require a cast. It's like, suppose you have an object variable. You can assign an integer to that object variable. That doesn't require a cast, because it's a supertype. Read only is a supertype of the other two. So it's just legal. Great, I see people nodding. That makes me very happy. Because <laughs> some people don't get that. Uh, but if you don't yet, you will soon. <coughs> OK, so that was that demo. Thanks for all the good questions. That's probably the most fun I've had giving that demo so far. <laughs> OK, so I've shown you that uh, in a canned demo situation, these uh, checkers work great. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about using them in real life. We've run them on multiple code bases that are more than 200,000 lines of code. Um, and every time I run the checkers, every time I run any checker on any code base, it always finds errors. Sometimes it finds important errors, sometimes it finds dumb errors. It always finds errors, and it finds important errors enough. And by these, I mean ones that a human being thought was important enough to fix. Yeah. So if you were to run this on a project that had 200,000 lines of code that didn't have any annotations to start with, would you get a lot of noise that you have to go through and fix, put in a lot of annotations before you get anything useful? Oh yeah, it'd be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> so practically speaking, you say it, it scales up to 200,000 lines of code, but that means that you you started small and, and worked your way up to 200,000. Um, no. So you have you have three options. One option is uh, choose from your code base a small part of the code that you really care about, annotate that and live with casts or warnings on the, ed on the boundary of it. And you could then scale up later. <coughs> Another possibility is, for instance, maybe you have a big system, but it only uses encrypted data uh, in a small part of it. You can imagine annotating the whole thing, all these is encrypted data, but uh, it's not going to be that many annotations on your entire code base. And then a great way to approach this is, uh, you have your huge code base, run type inference on it. Have it tell you all the types or at least have it get 90% of them right for you, and then you can uh, just fine tune or correct the places that it, it got the inference wrong. So when you say, it's, when you say the checkers are effective to 200,000 lines of code, are the type inference tools uh, scalable to 200,000 lines of code? Yes, they are. Okay, because the tools will get it. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Can you actually define what you mean by the fact that the scale to 200,000? So I'm not really talking about the speed of the checker so much, though the speed of the checker is fine. It uh, is less slow than, I mean, uh, when you add that into Java type checking, it's um, still the same order of magnitude of speed. What I really mean is that- No out of memory error. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're actually, um, if you try to run it on sufficiently huge uh, code bases, you may get an out of memory error because it's actually carrying along more information than the Java uh, compiler usually does. What I really mean is that uh, there are a lot of tools that can work on a very small code base, but uh, a code base this size is interesting not just because it's big, but because it probably has a lot of variety. There's probably really, any code base that big probably has really weird uses of generics. It probably has uh, interesting control flow structures, uh, that kind of thing. So what I really mean is that uh, it can handle a large diversity of code, in addition to you know being performant. So, yeah. One more question uh, for a I, I would call it a medium-sized code base, say five thousand lines of code. Mm -hmm. um, how much extra memory do you? How much memory does it, would this actually need to be able to run the type check? Five thousand lines of code is not going to be a problem. Okay. I mean, we're talking about stuff this big, and you know I just change the minus xmx argument to Java C to, to not default to something puny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a few megabytes more was fine, I, as I recall. I mean, don't quote me that on that. I can look up my uh, <laughs> Java C settings. OK, so basically, you you know, on a normal development box, you're not going to need to add extra extra space or something. Oh, no, no. All you'll have to do is change the minus xmx flag. Okay. Yeah. Of um, use of frameworks, uh, especially frameworks that use uh, massive amounts of proxies, and especially there are a few running around now that like the modification. Like, like, uh, 
Um, right. So our system, I mean, bytecode modification is uh, sort of in the realm of reflection. I mean, our system is going to check the code that it sees. Uh, in terms of frameworks with a lot of proxies, I think you have a bigger problem in terms of the framework you needing to do annotation on the framework than the fact that it uses proxies. Would there ever be a case where the checker might report something as being uh, uh, a problem when it's not because there's stuff happening at reflection and runtime and stuff? Um, so, with respect to reflection, it's more likely that the checker would give you a false negative. That is, it would think the code was what it was, but you're actually doing something tricky and evil at runtime. Oh. <laughs> the checkers do sometimes report a, uh, a, a false positive. That is, they say, ooh, I can't prove that this thing is non-null. And you say, oh, but right here it, it uh, you know, has some obscure test that I can see, figure out as a human, but that is beyond the, the ability of the type checking tool. Yeah? I'm probably jumping ahead here, but. I'll stop uh, you if you are. Are you certifying, or is there, is there any kind of a, a, a certification check look over of, of these checkers? That are coming on. Is anybody looking? Is it, you listed a whole bunch of universities mm -hmm. that are writing these things. Mm -hmm. Is anybody looking at them to see whether they're, you know, quality control kind of things? Um, so you're welcome can, to download can, them. Can. Everything is open source and freely available. Uh, we find bugs in them. Absolutely. I imagine you would learn a lot by comparing them. Yes. And in fact, I've been doing that. Uh, there are various other academic tools that are intended to do inference or checking. Um, none of them scale. It's been a problem. We've been able to compare on small code bases, and uh, we have th that has not revealed problems in our framework. Yeah. Is it compatible with Groovy C compiler? Um, okay, that's a great question. Right now, currently, it is compatible with Java C. So, for instance, if you want to use this in Eclipse, the way that you do it is to uh, have an external builder or to use Java C as your builder. That will be changing in the future, but that's the way it works now. Uh, essentially, it would be an extra implementation effort to target all of these other compilers, and we haven't got the manpower to do that right now. I mean, the other thing that you can do is just, uh, you do your ordinary compilation, and periodically you can also run the checker. So, of course, it's better if it runs on every compile. That's what you really want. Yeah. You said some of the other approaches don't scale. What, what causes them not to scale? Um, sometimes it's because they're using really heroic and tricky uh, static analysis that is uh, too time intensive or memory intensive. Sometimes it's because they just haven't thought about issues like generics because that didn't seem that interesting to them, uh, though it turns out to be important and very tricky in practice. Um, and sometimes it's just because they uh, built something that was good enough for them to get a paper out. <laughs> and, hey, I love getting papers out. <laughs> but I'm also interested in changing the way people think. And, and I believe if you put a tool in the hands of users, they teach you a tremendous amount. You learn a, a vast amount. Yeah. So I'm still trying to get a handle on uh, how effective this is for a, a production program. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you found errors in each code base you ran on. I'm curious if you ran on a significant code base that already had a good suite of unit tests that they'd run fine bugs on, you know, that they'd already gone through their normal quality. Control. Let me answer that question in the next couple slides. Okay. I've gotten a little bogged down here, though. These are all great questions. I mean, and if there's stuff that I want to address later, I'll address later, so keep asking them. And if I don't answer your question, uh, please ask it again. Okay. Yeah. So I was going to ask something, and you might cover it with that, uh, but you say that you ran it on systems that have over 200,000 lines of code. So those are existing systems that didn't have annotations Correct. in them. And right. so if you run it against something that has no annotations on it, it's not going to verify anything at first, right? I mean, you have to put the annotations in it or use the inference, right? Um, there are two different types of checkers. Some checkers, if you run them on completely unannotated code, they spew out a zillion errors. Okay. The nullness one is like that. Every dereference in your entire program, it'll say, whoa, that might be null. <laughs> there are other checkers where if you run them on unannotated code, they pass and say, everything looks perfect. Mutation is like that. The default is mutable. So it depends on which checkers you're using, right? And the default settings. Okay. Okay. Yes. 
So do you just run one at a time? Your examples only have one checker in the yeah, there's no reason you couldn't run more than one at a time. I personally only run one at a time. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether there is an issue with running. At one time, there was an issue with running more than one at a time in your implementation. I don't remember whether it's still oh, true or not. Wouldn't the errors be interspersed? Or, I mean, yeah, but that's okay. I mean, they'd all be in order in terms of line number. Yeah, but it could say, you know, here you have an unchecked cast. Here you have a, a wrong argument. Here you have a nullness error. Here you have a mutability error. It seems like if you did those sequentially and you had seven of them or whatever, however many checkers you were going to run on there, it would take a lot longer than doing oh, yeah. them all along the way, right? So I'm not saying that that's a long-term solution. Okay, okay. And uh, I'm actually very interested to see whether people end up running seven of them or not. Well, so I, I, I could imagine might, that, right? I could imagine that there are people who really get into this and want to run uh, seven or more of them. And I could imagine that people say, okay, you know, in my environment, okay, so I've had people on Wall Street tell me, in my environment, null pointer errors are a big, big deal. I've also had people tell me, in my environment, null pointers are not a big deal. I just don't want to be bothered with that. But mutability errors, uh, I find those bite me all the time. So I'm not telling you you have to use these. You, you've got to decide. That's your policy decision. And so I'm going to find it interesting to see how many more <coughs> average people I don't know. You can use different checkers on different days, like I'll just check on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> really, you want to run them all every time you compile. <laughs> so, you, know, you don't want to wait a week before you realize you've introduced some fundamental design error. Okay, let's, let's move on. Okay, so what if you had a code base on which find bugs had been run, for example? So here's a 4,000 line program. It was the biggest that. Uh, that I was willing to run these other tools on, that they were a pain. <laughs> um, the check, and, and they had some, some issues with other code bases. Um, this is just looking, so the, this program is only 4,500 lines. The checker framework found eight errors. The cool thing is, we know that it didn't miss any by design. It also gave four false warnings. So in other words, it gave 12 warnings, of which two thirds were real and the other four were things that you had to suppress with uh, an annotation or a cast or something. Or, or, in this case, we just put an assert not equal null four times in the code. And a human had to write 35 annotations. This is without any, uh, 35 annotations over 4,000 lines. And this is without use of any inference, because the inference didn't exist when we did this uh, particular study. So writing those annotations was that iterative, you run it, yeah. you see some effect. Yeah, exactly. You run it. It uh, issues some warning to say, oh, well, this parameter should have been non-null. So you add that. So this, the 8 and the 4 are after putting in the 35 annotations. That's what you were Correct. Like. Yeah. So here, I'm not including any suppressed warnings or asserts here. All right. Great question. Thanks for keeping me honest. So then we ran found bugs, find bugs. Find bugs reported zero warnings. So in other words, it missed eight errors. It issued one false positive. It wins in this in this column clearly. I mean, find bugs it has a different philosophy. Find bugs is a useful tool for certain circumstances and for certain uses. And of course, it does a lot more than null pointer checking too. Find bugs will find the really egregious errors. Uh, it does a very shallow analysis to find the low hanging fruit, and it's good at that. We also ran uh, JLint and PMD and JLint gave eight false warnings and didn't find any of the real errors. Uh, and PMD uh, just didn't say anything at all. Again, these don't require you to write those annotations. Though I would argue that writing the annotations gives you some benefit. Yeah. I'm sorry, I think I, mis I, I misunderstood the comment. You said you had to write, is that you had to write 35 annotations to kill the eight issues, or you wrote 35 issues, and then you ran it, and then found eight health wonders. Here's what happened. We ran it. It output like 20, 30, 40 issues, something like that. We looked at them and realized a lot of those are false positives that we could eliminate by just writing at non-null on a parameter, for example. When we were done with all that, there were 35 places we had to write at non-null or at nullable <coughs> on a parameter or a generic or something like that. Um, at that point, there were
were 12 warnings left where the correct, that weren't false positives, that weren't, uh, that should just be eliminated by writing an annotation. Of those, four of them, we eliminated, or we did a, uh, a human hand analysis of the code, determined that it could never go wrong at runtime, though there was a complicated reason. So here's an example of, of some, something that might happen. It actually did happen in this particular thing. There were a pair of regular expressions. One was for the start, and one was for the end. And they could be null, and if they were null, they were both null, um, or they could both be non-null. And there was a piece of code that tested whether the start regular expression was null or not, and if it was not null, then it matched both the start and the end regular expressions. And the checker said, oh, the end regular expression, that one might be null. I haven't seen you check that. But if you were to look at all the code, all the places that they get set, then whenever the one was set to non-null, the other was always set to non-null. So that's a fact about the program that was beyond the scope of the type checker. And so there we said, if start regular expression is not equal to null, assert end regular expression is not equal to null, we added that assertion, and then the rest of the code type checked properly. So that was one of these four. Does that make sense? You don't look 100% satisfied. Well, I am I would actually say that, 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 that in that case, on running the type checker, you have 39 false positives that you had to shut up. Yeah. So, I mean, but these, uh, well, that was on running it on a completely unannotated code base. Right. Yeah, maybe you should give like two rows with zero annotations written, so many false warnings, and uh, what do you have here? Because initially, when you ran it, there was like 39 issues, but then you well, went to care. There weren't necessarily 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 39. There were actually 37 issues, eight of which were actual real problems, and the other, or there was 40. But I mean, okay, so how long did it take? Yeah. Well, how how long did it take? Here's the problem. How the long did it take? Part. Hold on. How long did it take to deal with these? Like two seconds a piece. How long did it take to deal with these? Long time sat there, looked at every path through the entire program. How long did it take to deal with these? Even longer, trying to figure out what the hell someone was thinking when they wrote that code to begin with. <laughs> oh, that was wrong. The time for these way dominates the time for this. this these were all the easy ones. So, so and half the time you just looked at a comment that was in the English, and you just translated that into an annotation. Okay, so for those 35, you ran it once, you got this list of about 40 or 50 messages for each one, you just looked at it, looked at the line, said, oh yeah, that's obvious, put an annotation, looked at the next one. Okay. Okay. That's exactly that's correct. correct. Still a false positive. I mean, it's quickly resolved false positive, right. but it's a false positive. Um, the other way to look at it is that your program was wrong. You had the wrong, you had written the wrong types. That's like saying, you started out with all objects in uh, well, everywhere in your code, and you haven't yet changed it to, to what the, the types really are. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get direct, I don't want to really argue that point, but that, then I would say that I wouldn't have needed 35 annotations to, that would have meant that I would have had to correct the code. Right, and well, these are correct the code. annotations are the code. These are writing the correct this, type. Your types were wrong in your program. This is writing the right types. Once you've written the correct types, and every type in the program is an honest representation of the values that can be there, then you have four false warnings, and uh, there were eight real errors. Yeah. So um, for a uh, new um, program that you're developing or something, you know, this sounds a great idea and everything, but if you're dealing with an existing code base, it could be a decent amount of time if you're yes. capturing that build. Is I it? mean, and that's a case where you probably want to use type inference and mm -hmm. you want to start in the critical parts of your code. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know where the problems are in your code. You know where you need a little <laughs> extra attention. Um, so I'd also like to point out that the number of annotations you write <coughs> is much less in new code. That's because in new code, you're actually thinking about this stuff, and you're, you're and this is forcing you to use a slightly better design. And that's something I'll get to in a second. Can you um, yes. scope the checker to only look at certain parts of your code? I mean, it's kind of a okay yeah. feature. Um, I mean, you could just supply those arguments on the right. command line. Okay. There are command line arguments to tell it to ignore, calls it to certain libraries, cool. etc. Cool. Okay. Um, so the checkers are actually fairly rich. So they handle inheritance, they handle, handle overriding, they handle a polymorphism on, uh, on 
types, that is generics, that handle polymorphism, polymorphism on qualifiers. We talked about that a little bit ago. They have this flow sensitive type qualifier inference that some of you asked about when we saw it. Uh, that's uh, noticing that even though you declared something as non null, I mean, as nullable, it's really non null, so we'll just treat it that way. Um, you can customize the defaults, you can suppress warnings, and there are a bunch of other features like that. So, how usable are these things? They're integrated with the tool chain, uh, best with Java C, uh, also Ant and Maven. There's an Eclipse plugin that I've already told you about its uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, NetBeans is built directly on top of Java C, so you pretty much get that for free. And there aren't that many false positives, and that's actually very cool. The false positives for the nullness checker are orders of magnitude worse than the false positives for any other checker. And the reason for that is Java programmers use null for so many different things. So a key issue here is that annotations aren't too verbose. For the non-null checker, over many thousands of lines of code, we found that there was one annotation in every 75 lines of code. And for the intern checker, we had a 220,000 line code base with 124 annotations total throughout the code base. It revealed 11 real bugs. Um, as I mentioned, you can annotate as part of your program. New code has a lot fewer annotations. I just mentioned that. Um, and we have inference tools for just two of the type systems, for nullness and for mutability. For the others, we're working on inference tools, but they're not done. So I've already told you about the caveat. You know that your program satisfies the type property and there are no bugs of particular varieties. That's not a, a complete guarantee of no bugs at all. That's the future work. Um, but the key is that this is only for the code that you actually check. So uh, not native methods, not reflection. You can compile code with another compiler, and that will carry the annotations through to the class file, but won't do the checking. You are allowed to suppress warnings with a cast or with an explicit uh, annotation, and that indicates exactly the code that a human should analyze. Relax about the rest, pay attention to the places where you've suppressed a warning. And checking just part of the program is still useful. So you're saying you can you can annotate a part of the program to say don't check this section of the program. Um, you say suppress well, or? typically, yeah. Uh, so that's a, com com a command line argument to the compiler. What I'm talking about here in suppress warnings is you know how you can write at suppress warnings on top of a Java method, right. and then it will suppress warnings in that. You can do the same thing here, okay, yeah. or on a declaration or at various other locations. And sometimes you need to do that. The example of, you know, is this a legal SQL query was, was one I gave earlier. So, so on the previous slide where you had the, the number of lines that were annotated, uh -huh. is the, would you say the non-null, no, the next slide, the, the non-null, which is one out of every 75 oh, lines, is that like the largest number of annotations? If you, on, on no. your programs where you use a bunch of these different checkers, presumably, what's the overall mm -hmm. one in N lines for all of them to combine? So, Non-null is the most verbose. Okay. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Non-null is not the most verbose. The uh, mutability ones we're seeing more like one per forty lines, something like that. And remember, all the numbers I'm giving you are for existing code that has been uh, annotated after the fact. Right. So for new code, the numbers seem to be much lower. So if you're going to take existing code and put in all of these different annotations, you might end up with. One and on average, one out of twenty, one out of thirty. Yeah, or one out of ten, maybe even. If you're going to use okay. all of these, and you should think about which are the ones that are most useful to you. I mean, it's still not that bad. It's less than, for instance, the overhead for using generics, right. which you can decide whether that's something you want, right? <laughs> Speaking yeah. of generics, could you have implemented generics using annotations? Um, you could have, and it wouldn't be the right thing. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the syntax of annotations is too limited. It would just be really, really ugly. And uh, you'd have to have too much logic in the, uh, the annotation checker that really belongs in the compiler. Um, okay, so the checker comes with an annotated JDK on the signatures, not on the bodies. So it's not checking whether there are any bugs in the JDK. 
It's just checking that you're using the JDK in the way the JDK is intended to be used. Um, and I already mentioned that there are inference tools. The, actually, the biggest difficulty with this really is you have some gargantuan third-party library you, you're using. You'd like to have guarantees about your code, and but if you haven't annotated that library, your guarantees stop at the moment you go into the library. That's actually that can be uh, discouraging. It's not as much of a problem for subtype qualifiers like uh, like non-null. It's a bigger problem for supertype qualifiers like uh, immutable. Um, I am curious. Have you guys thought about running the checkers against the open source parts of the JDK? I mean, so we have access to the whole thing. It actually doesn't make sense to do that, and the reason is that the JDK is not even generics correct. So uh, <laughs> they took their pre-existing code base, they retrofitted a signatures that were generic on top of them, but oftentimes the bodies don't type check, right. and we essentially make the assumption that your code is generics correct because we feel like that's even more basic. Once you have that, then you can think about this more advanced stuff. Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little, I'll go briefly over how you might write your own checker. What time is it? It's 8.36. Okay. 20, 25 minutes. 20, 25 minutes, sounds great. So how can you write your own checker? First, let's talk about security. Um, this is an example of SQL injection. We have. Uh, a bug in server code that uh, use, creates a SQL query using unfiltered input. Here is the code from the server. It says the query is select star from users where name equals user input, and then you close the quotes and semicolon, it's all great. But the user inputs this. And now here is the value of query where name equals A or T equals T. So this uh, returns all the information in your entire database. This is not what you want to happen. In the box is the complete code of a checker for tameness. It's the whole thing. So if you want to use this, then you write tainted in your program. Uh, you, you can write untainted in your program. For instance, you could say get post takes an untainted string in category and then works on that. You would also need to, to find whatever validation uh, code you have, annotate that properly, and that would probably include the one place in your code that has an unchecked cast. Now you compile your program. Uh, in this case, we're using a processor called the basic checker, which is why this one's so short, and it's using a qualifier named untainted, and now this will tell you where there are problems. So let's uh, see a demo of that. So this is code uh, from something called personal blog, uh, which I found on SourceForge. Here's, and I've already added the annotations to it. Here's execute query. I say execute query should take an untainted string query because that's going to uh, send that directly to session.find. And construct query also takes an untainted a list of strings and it concatenates them all. Now, the checker that you saw, it's four lines long, it doesn't understand when you concatenate a bunch of untainted things, you get an untainted thing back. So that's why we have this cast right here, and we've suppressed that warning there, because otherwise you'd, you'd get a warning. So let's see what happens when we run the checker on this. Necessarily untainted. So the uh, now you've got to figure out: should this be quoting it, or should this be taking something that's untainted? Well, after you've groveled around in the code, you discover that this is what the spec should really be. So let's run that again. Now we get to here. This is a this is a client of that other code. I just showed you that I was changing uh, get post by category, and this is a client of that. It's sending in 
uh, request category, and where did that come from? It came from right here. It's pulling it out of a user supplied parameter, and it's carefully making sure that it is not null. But it's not uh, validated. <coughs> and if you go down to the end, you see that we have this validate routine. And the validate routine takes a user input and makes sure that uh, it complains if it's not a letter or a digit or white space. Uh, and now, then it just, uh, if it, it throws an exception or it just returns, and uh, if it returns, then that thing is untainted, which is why this returns untainted. So what we really want to do then is, so, sorry, uh -huh. wouldn't you want to pass around tainted strings until you actually needed to use them? Because only then would you know how to untaint them. So there are two possibilities. If, if you want to structure your code really well, there are two possibilities. One is the moment you get something from a user, untaint it right away. But then you don't know what it's going to get used for, potentially downline from 50 method calls. So you don't know what untainted means. At, at oh, the point of right. For instance, you don't know is this uh, going to is this going into a SQL query? Is it going into HTML output, etc. Right. The other possibility is wait until the last minute. Both of these are really fraught with, with danger because you have a possibility of passing something through multiple places. The alternative is you actually mark everything anywhere in the code. You can use whatever policy you want, change it whenever you like. They're all marked as whether they're tainted or not. And here, tainted really means with respect to SQL. Here. I mean, and you might have a different type of tainting with respect to HTML, for example. So what we really needed to do here was um, to uh, go up to You're not using this for the seizure here. website, are you? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> so if we validate this. Third party tools. Which probably is more bugs. And then rerun it then that eliminates the error. And so you don't have to put the annotation on the declaration of that, because it's just off. That makes sense, okay. I don't have to put the annotation on the declaration of string request category. Oh. Because it's just on the call valid, right? Well, no. So this is an example of the uh, flow sensitive local type qualifier inference. Right. Refinement, really. Right, okay. Right. So, so we've said that it's tainted. But you're assigning something that's clearly untainted into it. So from this point down, we can assume it's untainted. Okay. Now, it would be perfectly correct and more explicit to write it here, but you don't have to. You don't have to clutter your code in that way. If you want to write it, if you think that's good documentation, then by all means do it. Totally legal. Doesn't affect the, the operation at all. So is there a tainted annotation? Um, no, this is a, I mean, you saw everything there was to the checker. So the if you want to augment just... it in clever ways, you can, such as adding that. And that's not hard to do. It's just more than four lines. And in fact, that, that attribute, there was no semantics involvement. It's just kind of marker. Right? Yeah. So that's a, a very good observation. I'm going to get into that in just a slide or two. This is saying there are some strings that are blue, and there are some strings that are not blue. And all we're making sure is that the paint doesn't mix. Right? All the blue stuff says blue, and all the not blue stuff says not blue. And, uh, and then we added uh, either two or three, maybe three casts in the program at the places where you're, you're actually safely changing between the colors. Yeah, all the, all the semantics <laughs> sits right in this box. And of course, you would probably enhance this to, uh, to understand some, some other things if you wanted to. Though, this is useful already. So you can use it in other things than string. Understand Absolutely, it. yes. I mean, it can mean whatever you like, right? Though, I mean, my recommendation would be that you would, should probably call this, you know, untainted SQL or something, and then have another one whose definition might be identical for something else. Yeah. What does that third line do? Does it fall tree? So let me, uh, let me defer that for one second. Essentially it says, 
if you have a literal, starts with double quotes, ends with double quotes, written by the programmer in the source code of the program, that thing's untainted. We trust it. Yeah? Um, your fourth line has a set of brackets. Uh huh. There's nothing between them. <coughs> can there think, be things between them? And so, what, what can be between them? Yes, there can. So, this fourth line is a totally standard Java 5 declaration of an annotation. And annotations are allowed to have uh, fields, though they have to be written looking like methods. Yeah. Yes, you could imagine like putting in a, a string array which has like untainted it for SQL, JavaScript, whatever, sort of as an extension. Yeah. Let me let me actually show you uh, how you define a type system. I think this will answer some questions. So if it doesn't, ask me again, please. So let's define uh, the <coughs> non-null type. Uh, the non-null annotation. So this first line is just standard Java 5. That's how you define a thing at non-null that you can then write in your program. A lot of Java programmers haven't seen this kind of thing, though. It's usually just done by library writers, sort of like wildcard. This is the way you say, this thing is a type qualifier. Now, if you want to de define a type system, you have to specify three things about the type system. The first is you have to declare the type qualifier hierarchy. That's going to tell you all the subtyping relationships. The second thing is you have to declare type introduction rules. That's places where even when you don't write a cast or any other annotation, it's still there for you. And the third is all the other type rules, the special type rules, the places that an error can get erased. So let me show you how you do each of those things. First, the type qualifier hierarchy. Nullable object is the root of the hierarchy. Non-null object is a subtype of that. Nullable date is a subtype of nullable object. And non-null date is a subtype of both of these. Now, once you've declared this, ordinary Java type checking rules do almost everything for you. For instance, if you have an object variable, you can assign a string into it. If you have a string variable, you can't assign an object into it. Java doesn't allow that. Same thing here. If you have a variable that's nullable, then you can assign to it from an R value that's nullable. Sorry, from a date that's nullable, or from uh, an R value that's non-null, but not the other way. So this already handles um, all inheritance, all method overriding, all assignment, all method call, all method return. Yeah. yeah so that explains why you don't just have a single nullable annotation where like it takes like a boolean true false. It was one thing I was wondering about. You know, why have oh. this cluster and have a nullable and not null? Not null and not just one, but it's, it's because of this. Uh, you could do that. It would not work as well in our, our framework isn't designed for it, though we've done something like that in our framework. Um, and I also think it's a little bit easier and a little bit clearer to write non null or nullable rather than just one with a Boolean that you have to read. And, and that's a little longer, too. But you could do the other. Yeah, but then you wouldn't have the, the uh, inheritance. So well, you'd have to say nullable true is a super type of nullable false. Oh, you can do that. You need to write your own code rather than, uh, our, our system doesn't do it for you automatically. So the way you say that is that non-null is a subtype of nullable. So that's how you declare this whole hierarchy. The next thing to do is type introduction rules. So if you say new date, or hello plus get name, or boolean.true, all of these things are non-null. Are non They're guaranteed never to be null, these expressions. But you don't want to have to write that every time. So we say that this is implicit for trees, essentially uh, uh, this is part of the AST, and right. then for an expression that has new, that is creating a, a new class, or for the plus operator, or for any Boolean literal, and there's a ton more there. Then the third part is the other type rules, and this is where the real action happens. So for instance, we would like to warn if the expression in a synchronized uh, block could possibly be null, because if it is, you get a null pointer exception. There's actually a bunch of places like this where you might get a null pointer exception that often don't think about. Another reason to use a, a checker. So we want to warn if that might be null. And here's how you do it. 
you write code in this case, you override a method in the framework called visit synchronized that visits synchronized blocks, and you pull out some expressions from the AST. But here's the, the key line. If the type does not have the annotation non-null, then you report a failure, and this is just calling into the compiler uh, error reporting. And then you have like, half a dozen of these for dereference and for a few other places that you need, for the half a dozen places that you want to have that, that check. And that's more or less what it looks like. Where does that code go? Oh, so uh, so your checker consists of typically two or three different classes. Um, one to declare the annotation, one to declare the, uh, the annotation factory, which given a, an expression <coughs> tells you the type, and one to declare the visitor, which is something that walks over all your code and does the checking. So this is part of the visitor. It walks over all of your code, and for every uh, every node in the AST, does a check, and by default does nothing. But you can over well default it, it by default it just checks all the subtyping rules, but you can also add additional checks if you like. So how big is the, the largest annotation implementation? Uh, four or five hundred lines. Okay. And uh, actually, so there are four I think that are distributed with the checkers and. Three of them are about 400 lines long, and one is shorter. And uh, for instance, if you look at the nullness one, the reason it's so big is because it has very sophisticated flow sensitivity rules. You don't need those. That, that was uh, for the local type refinement. So that you know, after this kind of if, then you, or this kind of, uh, of call. And the reason is that, again, people use null in so many weird ways that those rules need to be much more sophisticated for nullness than they do for any of the other checkers. Good question. Okay, so now I'm done. Um, there are a bunch of research, oh, yeah, I'm not done. Real, real quick, uh, the type rules, so before when you were saying you're guaranteed you know, to bad data annotations, you're guaranteed not to have that type of error. Uh, that relies on your type rules being Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. That's correct. And so if you had gotten all the dereferences but you'd forgotten the synchronized expression, you'd forgotten to check this, then you you know if there's a bug in your checker, then you know the guarantee's not gonna be non null annotations and everything on in your in your uh, checker. Well another part to that is if there's a bug in the code that you use to validate it or whatever to say now this really is not not untainted, right? Then that's a problem too. Yes. Those are the I mean, two places, right, where you can screw up when you're using these. Right. So, I mean, the one is a user error. Uh -huh. I mean, in that you have not checked some code you should have checked. Uh, you know, maybe you should have checked it by hand, or maybe you should have run the checker on it. And then this is a um, an error on the part of if you've forgotten this, that would be an error on the part of the person who wrote the checker. Yeah. So. It's true. If there's a bug in the checker, then of course it's not going to give this as the guarantees. But the checker is open source, so. Oh yeah. I mean, you can read the 500 lines. Yeah. Of course, it relies on a bigger framework, and there might be a bug in that framework, etc. But you run your own checker on your checker, guaranteeing there's no bugs. <laughs> <laughs> guaranteeing, there no, guaranteeing there are no bugs of certain types. <laughs> Never got a pointer. The null pointer checker doesn't mean that your null pointer checker writes check bugs. Correct. Okay. Good question. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there are a bunch of research results that Pinhead professors get really excited about, and I like to tell them about that. You might not uh, be as interested in this, but uh, you know we're very. Some people are very frustrated that practitioners are not running out to use all the type systems people have made up. That's because. Uh, there have been too few case studies because it's been too hard to build these things. So we've built new type systems, found things about old ones. There's this cool linear time inference algorithm, and there's a paper that you can read all about. Um, I do a lot of other types of research. I'm interested in security, in programming languages, in testing, in uh, analyzing version histories, etc. 
essentially anything that can help people to do a better job, because programming is tremendous fun, and it's more fun if you get it right. <laughs> so the key takeaways are that there's this thing called the checker framework, and it lets you create custom type checkers. Um, they have, they're featureful, they are effective, um, they're relatively easy to use, and they're scalable. Now, I encourage you to go out and try them. If you have problems, let me know. We respond to bug reports, we fix things. I'm happy to sit down with you and try to figure stuff out. I'm not claiming that it's going to be perfect and it's going to solve all your problems. I've heard from some people who've used them that they were really useful. Other people tried them out, said that's interesting, and it's not solving, it's not scratching exactly my edge. Um, the cool thing about them is that they can prevent bugs compile time, and you can use the ones we distribute, like nullness and interning and mutability, or you can create your own if you want. And there's a download from this URL. So I know uh, you didn't really get a chance to ask questions during the talk. So <laughs> <laughs> if you have any now, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yeah? So the AST you're using in the checkers, that's directly the one provided by Java C? That's correct. Yeah, so like if you want to do port to, I don't know, Eclipse compiler, that's... that's uh, Right, that's actually a weakness of the current implementation. So there is a, uh, I think JSR 298 or 198 declares a, an AST that all Java compilers shall support. And it has been implemented zero times, <laughs> uh, including by the proposer and by Sun that, that endorsed it. If that were implemented, then these things would port. Today, all the ASTs are a little bit different. So you would have to re-implement our framework to uh, using the slightly different names of the different things in the different ASTs. So that's the reason that I was telling you that if you want to use this in Eclipse, you do that as an external builder. Yeah? Um, at the very beginning, I mentioned this one before, but you listed the various uh, academic institutions that were creating more checkers for the framework. But um, where and I noticed uh, this is actually triggered by this MIT.edu uh, URL that you put up there. Um, where's the home of this of this work? Is it here at, at UW or is it MIT or so? Where is the where is the uh, mecca for this? Uh, the the home is here. So the situation is that I was a professor at MIT for a little over eight years, and in January I moved here because I thought it was a better environment for research and for teaching. Okay. So. Uh, I still have students there. Uh, they're finishing up. I have not moved the URLs because I don't want to do that until they finish up to keep things convenient for them. But it will be moving. Um, the, lang the stuff about the annotations is going to be in build 61 of OpenJDK. So the stuff about the checkers themselves, which is helping you define the syntax, the semantics, is not part of Java itself. If we're lucky, that will get shipped as part of the JDK. That uh, is still under negotiation. It will, it's open source, and you can download it. 